So roaming and peering. Um, it's my favorite topic. Uh, I've been talking about this for a few years. And so, like I said this morning, why would you exchange traffic? I think the reasons are pretty much clear. I think the most important reason is to increase battery life, uh, because that um, uh, makes uh, LoRaWAN solutions very often more viable. And uh, we also often get the questions, why, do, why won't you use LoRaWAN roaming? Because LoRaWAN roaming is designed for exchanging traffic, right? So we looked at LoRaWAN roaming, uh, the specifications, and we don't really think that it's a good idea. If you want to know why, I'm not going to go into details, but you can Google LoRaWAN roaming. First hit on Google is my article. It's a few minutes read, and you can learn why LoRaWAN roaming is a bad idea. So I'm not going to go into details. Um, the fact that this is the first hit in Google is also showing that it's not widely being used. So let's work on, a, on an alternative. So we have the packet broker, uh, and also we are launching this uh, uh, after, after this week. It's a global backbone for LoRaWAN traffic, supporting uplink, downlink, device activations. It's open source, hosted, but also available on premises. If you have a big network yourself and you need to exchange traffic within your own network, come to us, we give you a packet broker, and you can uh, do your own traffic exchange if you want. Um, the key features are that you can, and this is, uh, makes it different from LoRaWAN roaming, is that you can select which package you want to have. So if the device is in your own coverage area, and it, the device, the, the, you receive the message from your own gateways, why would you pay somebody else to, uh, for, for routing that message to you? Because you already have it. So you want to have control over which packets you, you actually get that you want to count in a transaction and which one you don't. Second is that we separate the uh, traffic routing from uh, billing and peering. And in LoRaWAN roaming, that's also really tied in together. You have to have a contract, because when the contract is in place, uh, there, there, the, the traffic uh, starts flowing. Um, third is that we separate payload from metadata, because those are two different, they have different value. Maybe you already received the payload from your own gateways, uh, but you want to have metadata for a better localization, for example. Or um, uh, you want to have both because you missed the payload and the metadata. And finally, you don't need to operate a LoRaWAN network. And I think uh, Lacuna Space is a really good example uh, because their, uh, their assets and their company is all about launching satellites. They don't have to implement any LoRaWAN network or anything, roaming, whatever. They just forward the traffic to Packet Broker, and Packet Broker does everything else for you. <clears throat> so how does it work? Today, this is uh, a standard cluster uh, running the thing stack. doesn't really matter. Your device sends a message picked up by a few gateways, sent to a gateway server, ends up in the application server. That's how normal traffic flows. So let's focus on these two things, the gateway server, application, uh, network server, sorry. The application server is still there, but it, it doesn't really matter for the rest of the uh, presentation. What matters is that we add a packet broker agent, and that's a client uh, a component that runs in your network and that interacts with a packet broker. So uh, packet broker agent uh, will become part of the thing stack, open source as well. And uh, if you have another network that uh, also has packet broker agent, uh, they can start exchanging traffic with each other. So how does it work? Um, oh yeah, it, it can be either the Things stack or the Things enterprise stack. Since the APIs are open, we welcome other uh, LoRaWAN network server vendors to look at the API and to see if they should implement it as well. It's, it's fully open. Uh, we would be very happy to work with other LNS vendors uh, and to see them join uh, the Packet Broker initiative. Um, Packet Broker has a few components. It has a data plane, which is facing towards the network clusters. It has a router, and in between there, we have uh, PubSub. And in our current implementation, we use Kafka, but it could also be uh, 
run in Google Cloud, or it could be using uh, open source NUTs, for example. You can run it on-premises. It doesn't really matter. It's a generic uh, PubSub. And the way it works is uh, that uh, the packet broker agent can have two connections with the data plane. It can be a forwarder or it can be a home network. And a forwarder is when you uh, are forwarding traffic from your gateways to the packet broker, and you are subscribing to downlink traffic. So you have your gateways, they receive data, you forward that to packet broker, and when uh, some home network says, OK, I want to send a downlink message, it uh, sends it back to the packet broker agent, and it forwards it to uh, the packet forwarder on the gateway, and then it gets sent. The other role is home network, and that is when you have devices, and you can subscribe to uplink messages coming from other networks, coming from forwarders, and you can publish downlink messages. So we have four, type, four directions of, uh, of yeah, two directions, but four uh, sorts of traffic exchanges, actually. You can also be only a gateway server. If you only have gateways, um, you're just a forwarder. And these are the tower companies, or these are the lacuna spaces that only have uh, infrastructure, and they don't operate a network. But you can also have only network servers that don't own infrastructure, virtual networks, that, um, that are not interested in deploying uh, physical infrastructure, but they go to the packet broker and they, um, uh, they see which, uh, uh, which other members to uh, exchange traffic with. Or you can do both. <clears throat> so how does it work if the device is on another, uh, uh, seen by another gateway? Traffic goes to gateway server. Gateway server says, OK, this message is not for my network. Offloads it to packet broker agent, sends it to the data plane, uh, picked up by the router, uh, sent back to another data plane instance, and then sent to the home network. It's very simple. Routing policies. So you want to control. This is also unique to the packet broker. You want to control how, w what, your, uh, what home networks can see, because this depends on the arrangement that you have with them. And so you can say, uh, as a forwarder network, so if you own a gateway, you can say per home network uh, what data they may receive. So that could be a join request, could be Mac layer payload, application layer payload, signal quality localization. You can do anything, you can do only uh, Mac payload, for example, you can pick and choose. And the same goes for downlink. And that means that you can open your gateways, for example, uh, for sending join accepts and for Mac layer downlink. So your gateways will be able to send uh, acknowledgments back to the devices or ADR instructions or things like that. Um, but not application payloads, because we have also uh, customers that would like to open their gateways, but they they, they would have a bad feeling with not knowing what the application payload is going to be that is sent from their gateways, which we completely understand. So we give that fine um, a level of control, and it's completely up to the forwarding network to decide what their gateways can be used for. So separating uh, routing from clearing and billing uh, means that um, we actually have another component in between. And all the traffic uh, sent to and from packet broker is by default encrypted. So before a forwarder sends a message to the packet broker, it encrypts it with, uh, with some encryption key. So the packet broker is not able to see what the traffic is about. And uh, the packet broker just blindly routes it to the home network. Uh, and then it's still encrypted. So the home network receives an encrypted packet and it needs to find a way to obtain the, encrypt, the encryption key to decrypt the message. And this is completely free. So we don't impose any marketplace, any billing model. If you want to exchange keys via a postcard, you can do that. Uh, routing is completely separate, and it's fully encrypted. So uh, this is what, a, what a, a header looks like in, uh, in the packet broker that's sent. It contains a teaser. So it doesn't contain the physical payload, but it describes what is in the message. 
So it says the device address, uh, whether there are frame options, the frame counter, the frame port, frame payload length, uh, if it's confirmed or not, and it has a hash of the physical payload. And with this, the home network can, uh, can figure out in real time whether it has received this message with the same hash already on its own gateways. And if it didn't, it can uh, find a way to decrypt this message. Uh, and again, that's um, uh, fully up to uh, the arrangement that they have. We do have a key exchange, though. Again, it's optional. And a key exchange uh, could be a balancer. So you could have two networks that are sending a lot of traffic to each other. And uh, the balancer keeps track of the difference between uh, how much traffic is sent from one network to the other. And maybe they want to only uh, clear or have a, uh, some small transaction on the difference, if it's not fair. Or maybe they don't care about this at all. Uh, maybe there is no encryption at all, because it's not required. Or um, the uh, two networks have their own way of exchanging the security keys. So this is how the packet broker works. Um, yeah, it, it's a maybe it's not something that is, uh, makes complete sense to you right now. I totally understand that. Uh, but uh, it doesn't really matter. How to join the packet broker? Packet Broker is fully LoRaWAN compliant, and that means that we route traffic based on LoRa Alliance net IDs. And so uh, you have to have a net ID, and that means that you uh, need to be a member of the LoRa Alliance, um, which is uh, a little bit painful um, because it costs at least uh, $3,000 per year, uh, and that's the, the, the smallest net ID block that you can get. Uh, if you are a contributor or sponsor, it, it gets more expensive. Um, but this is for larger um, private network operators like cities or um, uh, larger companies that wouldn't be, uh, be an issue. And you need to support a network server that, um, that supports Packet Broker. So that's the Thing Stack, the Things Enterprise Stack. Um, we also expose the passive roaming interfaces. You don't get all the nice features that the Packet Broker supports. But you can start exchanging traffic with, uh, with the packet broker via the standard interfaces. Um, and if you are using another uh, network server, ask your vendor to implement the packet broker API, and hopefully they will do that. You also need to have a certificate, send an email, and you're done. You can start exchanging.